especially thank you to our speakers, to our first speaker, Lou Wong, and um, I think I will leave it to her to uh, explain her topic and get us going. Okay, okay. thank you, Pat. Well, thank you so much for coming so early um, to hear about my project. And um, as I mentioned in the handout, it's in a very early stage. And so um, I have a structure for the project, but it hasn't been thoroughly researched. And there are a lot of things I'm thinking through. So I really appreciate your thoughts. Um, at the end, if you could um, you know, tell me what you think about the project and any ideas uh, for moving forward. So first I wanted to give you some background on the kind of work that I do and um, why I'm interested in this particular topic. And um, so generally speaking, my entire um, career, I have been focused on social dynamics and how the law incorporates an understanding of social dynamics into various areas. And most recently, I've been interested in service work. Um, that is the issues that come out specifically with respect to discrimination in employment and also discrimination in public accommodations um, in the service industry. And there are a couple of reasons why I'm especially interested in service work. One of them just relates to my general interest in social dynamics, and that is um, interactive service work really consists of the commercialization of social interaction, right? Um, it includes simulated friendships in a way, um, and it is, um, as um, sociologist Arlie Hochschild referred to the kind of work that service workers do, emotional labor, um, she describes that as the commercialization of human feeling, right? So we're making um, social interaction the subject of a commercial transaction. And in another project that I'm working on that focuses more on discrimination and public accommodations against customers, um, what I argue is that in an interactive service transaction, the dignity of the parties, that is the server and the customers, becomes the currency of the transaction. Um, and so service work is really just an extension of my broader interest in social dynamics. Also, for purposes of legal intervention um, when discrimination occurs, service work is really interesting and complicated because it differs from the sort of standard dyadic um, employment relationship that the employment discrimination laws were built upon, right? So they were enacted during more of an industrial age as opposed to now when service industries are dominant. And they tend to view the work relationship as, you know, supervisor, employee, um, very hierarchical, right? You've got your organization chart and the way the Supreme Court has developed um, the doctrine under Title VII is um, really built upon this very hierarchical understanding of relationships at work. Service work is really different though, and um, sociologists have taken the lead in explaining how it's different and why we need to understand those differences. And that is, um, service work is really more of a triangular set of relationships in the workplace. Um, often referred to as the service triangle, where the formal parties to the employment relationship, the firm and the server in our case, um, are just one part of the entire structure of intersecting relationships, right? That is, the customer plays a really big role in service work. Um, the customer actually drives a lot of decisions that the firm makes because they are interested in maximizing their profits. And the customer actually has, in many cases, greater influence on the worker than the formal boss does, right? So if you think about it, um, in interactive service work, the customer is directly interacting with the server. The manager or supervisor may be in some distant location, um, not even really witnessing or participating in that transaction. Um, and um, the customer, therefore, can have much greater influence than the formal supervisor or boss. So in this project, um, as you know, my particular interest is on how the structure of the service work relationship um, influences sexual harassment in the workplace. Um, and what I'm also interested in is, um, in addition to the dynamics by which that occurs, I'm interested in how we might hold employers accountable for the harassment that workers are subject to, um, given that, as I mentioned earlier, Title VII is really not built for 
this type of a triangular setup. Okay, so service, oh, excuse me, sexual harassment is a problem for service workers generally, and I don't mean to suggest otherwise, but my particular focus today um, is on sexual harassment in the restaurant industry, primarily sexual harassment of servers and primarily sexual harassment of women restaurant servers. Um, it's gotten, this is something that has gotten a lot of attention recently. This report on the glass floor, which came out in 2014, um, did a pretty um, <coughs> big study of the problem, the prevalence of sexual harassment in the restaurant industry. What forms does it take? What role do work conditions have um, in facilitating sexual harassment? Um, and recently with the um, hashtag Me Too movement, um, there has been a lot of attention um, more broadly, um, including there's been some activism among servers. And so I just wanted to share this because I think this is clever and cute. Um, and I actually have this in my office. Um, a group of servers came up with this poster, what to do um, in case of sexual harassment. You are not powerless and it tells you you know, keep a record, tell your employer, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I don't know if you are familiar with this, but it's modeled on the <laughs> choking posters, right? Um, and if you think about it, what they're basically conveying is choking is a sort of common hazard in restaurants. Well, so is sexual harassment. Um, and so the idea is you would post these in the restaurant, um, in the workplaces, right, where the servers um, would see it, in addition to telling them what to do in case of choking. Okay, so this is a problem, um, obviously, in sexualized work environments. So Hooters, Hard Rock Cafe, right? Um, no surprise that sexual harassment of servers is very prevalent in those. But it's really not just limited to sexualized work environments. What the Glass Floor Report found, um, and if you read the sociology literature, um, it also supports this, is that sexual harassment of servers is very common um, across all different types of restaurants. And the um, Glass Floor Report um, you know, had really startling statistics um, that showed that on a weekly basis, women servers are being subjected to sexual harassment um, in, you know, in all manner of restaurants. So why is sexual harassment, while a problem in many workplaces, especially um, prevalent in restaurants? Well, it's because of this, right? It's because most restaurant servers rely on tips from customers for their livelihoods. Um, in fact, Many restaurant employers rely on customers' tips to compensate their workers almost entirely, right? Because you might be aware that in some states, if your workers are compensated through tips, you only have to pay what is known as a sub-minimum wage, which is like $2 and something an hour. The rest of it is assumed to be made up through tips, right? So um, this practice really puts employees employees um, at the mercy of customers, they're highly dependent on them just to survive, and by making customers the primary um, source of compensation for their workers, employers are delegating to customers two of their important responsibilities that we traditionally think of as the boss's job, right, or the firm's job, that is customers are evaluating their employees, and customers are paying their employees, right? So customers really are, um, in this situation, the same <coughs> boss. And what happens is um, that servers then are really wholly dependent on customers for their survival, and this is a really inconsistent and uncertain source of compensation because on the one hand, it constitutes the bulk of whatever a server is going to take home. On the other hand, customers have no obligation to servers whatsoever, right? There's no law that says you have to tip. It's really just a social norm. And even if you honor the norm, there's no rule that says it has to be a certain percentage. 
and studies have shown it really is very much subject to the whim of customers. Things like whether it's sunny outside or not affect the size of tips. Things like um, whether the server is wearing red lipstick or not can affect the size of tips. Um, how you present the check to the customer affects the size of tips. And so it's really a very precarious form of compensation in a line of work that is um, precarious to begin with. So if you think about it, it's kind of obvious why sexual harassment by customers would be a problem. Um, because first of all, if you are the source of someone's, and I guess I shouldn't say you because I don't think any of you would do this, but if one is the source of another person's compensation, that's sort of an emboldening um, thing to be aware of, right? And so a lot of customers seem to feel entitled to treat servers however they want because you know the tip is riding on it and they know that they're in total control of whether and how much to tip. And on the server side, um, there's incentive to go along with it, or at least disincentive to oppose um, harassment by customers because how much you take home is going to depend on how pleased the customer is with your response, right? And so customers are a big source of sexual harassment, um, and perhaps obviously so. Less obvious, I think, um, is, and so this is um, a series, a video series the New York Times did um, that asked servers, you know, and in all different kinds of restaurants, um, how do you factor this in when you decide how to respond to harassment? Um, but I think less obvious, but actually just as prevalent, if not more, um, based on the Glassfloor report, is harassment by managers and coworkers. And here again, tipping plays a big role in promoting sexual harassment by managers and co-workers because those parties have the ability to affect servers' tips in a couple of different ways, right? So managers, um, if a server, for example, does not go along with sexual harassment, gives the manager a hard time, manager can just cut your hours or a manager can assign you to work hours that are less lucrative, right? Um, the breakfast and lunch shifts instead of dinner when people are drinking, or the manager, let's say it's an establishment with different, um, you know, there's a case involving a casino where there was a certain part of the casino that was known for low tipping because it was like low stakes games versus the high roller section. Manager can assign you to the less lucrative section um, it, as punishment for not going along with harassment. Co-workers, even though they're not above you, also have the ability to affect your tips by sabotaging your work performance, right? If the cook um, is unhappy because a server won't go along with um, the cook's advances, maybe I'll just sort of delay the orders for, my, for that server's customers. Or I'll you know, not let the server know it's ready until it's gotten cold. And so the server then gets blamed, right, for these kinds of problems and tips are lower as well. And so servers have also reported, um, I need to watch out for that kind of thing because I could end up losing money if I make my coworkers unhappy. All right, so problem from all sides. Um, but again, as I mentioned earlier, legal redress is really challenging to um, fashion in this situation, again, complicated because Title VII, which would be our typical um, claim, a, a typical source of a claim um, for sexual harassment as a form of sex discrimination built on a dyadic model that does not take into account the structure of service work. And also, again, tipping further complicates the situation um, when we're trying to think of how to fashion a legal claim. So what I would like to turn to now is um, first, the doctrinal challenges, right, that um, would come up if a server were to pursue one of our standard claims for sexual harassment under Title VII, and then um, talk about the potential for maybe looking at the problem differently and trying to fashion a disparate impact claim instead. Okay, so let's talk first about the standard claim. Um, and you might already be familiar with this, um, but the real problem in a lot of sexual harassment cases is not necessarily proving right, that harassment occurred. 
uh, but it is in holding the employer accountable for it. And um, through a line of cases, the Supreme Court has um, developed the standards for employer liability in which they distinguish between vicarious liability or strict liability where the harasser's actions are imputed to the employer, right? That is, um, this employee harassed, you are automatically responsible, versus direct liability where the employer is liable only for its own wrongdoing that is, the employer is not automatically liable if someone, uh, if an employee is harassed, but we look at whether the employer was negligent, at least negligent, in allowing that harassment to occur. Okay, so the challenge here really is that the employer liability standards are built on a really narrow, really formalistic understanding of the structure of work relationships. And so vicarious or strict liability is only available really, I mean there is technically availability in another situation, but it's only really available when the supervisor, when a supervisor, excuse me, takes a tangible employment action, right? Supervisor, narrowly defined, and tangible employment action, narrowly defined, um, in the following way. So the court has, in that line of cases, find supervisor as those employees whom the employer has empowered to take tangible employment actions, right? And they said, we wanna have this really narrow unitary category because um, that is more administrable, that's more simple. They think somehow this is gonna promote um, the protection of rights. And um, tangible employment actions, which you have to be empowered to do, um, in order to be a supervisor, well, that's very narrowly defined as hiring, firing, failing to promote, reassignment with significantly different responsibilities, or a decision causing a significant change in benefits. I mean, almost limited to really serious, ultimate employment actions in certain ways. So that is um, a situation where the employer would be vicariously liable, but really only if the harassment took the form of a tangible employment action, right? So, for example, if um, a quid pro quo harassment occurred where um, the supervisor said, um, you know, have sex with me or else you're gonna be fired, and um, the employee doesn't comply and the employee is fired, or something like that, right? If no tangible employment action is taken, Technically, yes, the employer is still vicariously liable if it's a supervisor who committed the harassment, but there's an affirmative defense that is available, um, and you might be familiar with this as well, um, and this affirmative defense would apply even if there was a quid pro quo pro proposed, right, if it was not fulfilled, right, so if the threat wasn't carried through. Also would apply in the case of a hostile work environment um, claim the affirmative defense would be available. Okay, so very limited situation in which a um, employer would be vicariously liable. Would not apply in the situations that I described earlier. Okay, so first of all, um, even if it is a manager, that would not necessarily um, lead the employer to be held vicariously liable because the definition of supervisor does not include those who are not empowered to take tangible employment actions, even if they can control the day-to-day -day schedules and assignments of others. So the example I gave earlier of the manager who cuts your hours or puts you in um, a less lucrative section of the restaurant, um, that person not necessarily um, treated as a supervisor. And certainly customers wouldn't be, and certainly co-workers who don't have that sort of authority, even that much authority over you would not be. So what model would apply in that case? Well, that would be direct liability. Um, that applies to harassment by non-supervisory employees and third parties such as customers. And in that situation, the employer is liable for its own wrongdoing, that is negligence in controlling work conditions, um, 
meaning if the employer knew or should have known about the conduct and failed to stop it. And Justice Ginsburg dissenting to um, the court's line of reasoning um, in the Vance case said, this is a very employer friendly standard, right? Because it really requires the employer to be on notice in order to have any responsibility for the harassment. And that's a problem, right, in a lot of workplaces because a lot of times people don't want to complain um, when they are subject to harassment. We know this, there are studies that show this, um, and um, that's what Justice Ginsburg pointed out, right? If no complaint makes its way up to management, um, no liability. Well, if you think about it, are complaints gonna make their way up to management in the situation that I'm describing, right? A tipped server in a restaurant is not going to complain, and that's one of the big problems um, that tipping exacerbates. And that is, first of all, you're not gonna even oppose sexual harassment by customers unless you wanna lose your tips. You're not gonna complain about it to management, right, because then you're making the um, customer unhappy and also you're making management unhappy because another thing that they found is management does not tend to back up servers when customers behave abusively towards them because there's this whole culture in the service industry of customer sovereignty, right? The customer is king, the customer is always right. We don't want to make our customers unhappy. And so a lot of managers will actually admonish the server who complains and also, going along with that and exacerbating it is management kind of tries to promote sometimes the sexualization of their servers, even in non-sexualized restaurant environments, right? So they advise their servers, um, you know, smile more, look pretty, dress, you know, in a way that makes you seem available, even in, you know, what you would not consider to be a Hooters type environment. So not gonna complain about customers, um, employer not gonna get notice. Are you gonna complain about the manager? Are you gonna complain about your coworkers harassment? No, you're not gonna do that either, right? Because as mentioned earlier, they also can control your ability to get tips by sabotaging your work, um, by assigning you to unattractive um, shifts and so forth. So again, reliance on tips makes matters even worse than they would be in another work environment. So, what can we do about this? Well, as you might have gathered, I think the reliance on tips is a huge part of the problem. I'm not saying it's the only cause of the problem of sexual harassment of workers, because again, um, in other service contexts, workers are subject to sexual harassment, and we know that in many work environments, this um, is a problem, but tipping does seem to make the problem worse, and the Glass 4 study found um, that indeed it does, right? Because um, especially in states where servers get the subminimum wage, it's worse than in states where they rely on tips, but their minimum wage is a little bit higher. So the reason why um, I think we need to focus on tipping itself and not necessarily the individual behavior of um, the perpetrators, right? But the practice of relying on tips is because it affects servers' incentives, it affects the behavior of other people in the workplace, right? It makes the work environment worse for those who rely on tips because it promotes and facilitates harassment by customers and coworkers. And so what I'm interested in exploring, um, and I think this is gonna be challenging, but I would like to try it, is um, to develop a disparate impact claim based on a particular employment practice that is the practice of relying on tips to compensate your employees. And um, the disparate impact claim, you know, has many um, components to it, um, but I'm gonna focus on um, ideas for making out the prima facie case, which requires a plaintiff to show that a particular employment practice causes a disparate impact, right? And this is a very challenging, um, Thing to accomplish and that's where the empirical research project that I mentioned in the handout is going to come into play. Um, I think it's always challenging. It's going to be even more challenging to develop a disparate impact claim in this context because um, it's not your typical disparate impact claim, right? We usually think of disparate impact as um, challenging selection criteria, right? Height and weight, 
rules um, or tests that you have to um, perform at a certain level on in order to get a job, or maybe a, um, you know, a rule or policy that affects um, a certain group adversely um, in a disproportionate way. Here, the challenge is, um, again, going back to the structure of service work, the challenge is that the reason why the particular employment practice causes a disparate impact um, is because it affects the behavior of other people. Um, and so that's where it's going to get tricky to try to figure out a way to make that argument. And so here's where I'm thinking. First of all, some scholars have said that we ought to view the hostile work environment as a harm, not as a different type of claim, right? So that other stuff that I was showing you earlier about um, the employer liability standards that apply when you make a claim of sexual harassment, these scholars would say, that's just employer liability standards for discrimination in the workplace. Sexual harassment is really just a type of harm that can occur to you in the workplace, right? Like being terminated or, you know, being given um, duties that are in this situation, thus <coughs> the loss. And what happens is um, that servers then are really wholly dependent on customers for their survival. And this is a really inconsistent and uncertain source of compensation because <coughs> on the one hand, it <coughs> constitutes the bulk of whatever a server is gonna take home, on the other hand, customers have no obligation to servers whatsoever, right? There's no law that says you have to tip. It's really just a social norm. And even if you honor the norm, there's no rule that says it has to be a certain percentage. And studies have shown it really is very much subject to the whim of customers. Things like whether it's sunny outside or not affect the size of tips. Things like um, whether the server is wearing red lipstick or not can affect the size of tips. Um, how you present the check to the customer affects the size of tips. And so it's really a very precarious form of compensation in a line of work that is um, precarious to begin with. So if you think about it, it's kind of obvious why sexual harassment by customers would be a problem. Um, because first of all, if you are the source of someone's, and I guess I shouldn't say you because I don't think any of you would do this, but if one is the source of another person's compensation, that's sort of an emboldening um, thing to be aware of, right? And so a lot of customers seem to feel entitled to treat servers however they want because, you know, the tip is riding on it and they know that they're in total control of whether and how much to tip. And on the server side, um, there's incentive to go along with it, or at least disincentive to oppose um, harassment by customers because how much you take home is going to depend on how pleased the customer is with your response, right? And so customers are a big source of sexual harassment, um, and perhaps obviously so. Less obvious, I think, um, is, and so this is um, a series, a video series the New York Times did um, that asked servers, you know, and in all different kinds of restaurants, um, how do you factor this in when you decide how to respond to harassment? Um, but I think less obvious, but actually just as prevalent, if not more, um, based on the Glassfloor report, is harassment by managers and coworkers. And here again, tipping plays a big role in promoting sexual harassment by managers and coworkers because those parties have the ability to affect servers' tips in a couple of different ways, right? So managers, um, if a server, for example, does not go along with sexual harassment, gives the manager a hard time, manager can just cut your hours or a manager can assign you to work hours that are less lucrative, right? Um, the breakfast and lunch shifts instead of dinner when people are drinking, or the manager, let's say it's an establishment with different, um, you know, there's a case involving a casino where there was a certain part of the casino that was known for low tipping because it was like low stakes games versus the high roller section. Manager can assign you to the less lucrative section um, it, as punishment for not going along with harassment. Coworkers, even though they're not above you, 
also have the ability to affect your tips by sabotaging your work performance, right? If the cook um, is unhappy because a server won't go along with um, the cook's advances, maybe I'll just sort of delay the orders for, my, for that server's customers. Or I'll you know, not let the server know it's ready until it's gotten cold. And so the server then gets blamed right, for these kinds of problems and tips are lower as well. And so servers have also reported, um, I need to watch out for that kind of thing because I could end up losing money if I make my coworkers unhappy. All right, so problem from all sides. Um, but again, as I mentioned earlier, legal redress is really challenging to um, fashion in this situation. Again, complicated because Title VII, which would be our typical um, claim, a, a typical source of a claim um, for sexual harassment as a form of sex discrimination built on a dyadic model that does not take into account the structure of service work. And also, again, tipping further complicates the situation um, when we're trying to think of how to fashion a legal claim. So what I would like to turn to now is um, first the doctrinal challenges, right, that um, would come up if a server were to pursue one of our standard claims for sexual harassment under Title VII, and then um, talk about the potential for maybe looking at the problem differently and trying to fashion a disparate impact claim instead. Okay, so let's talk first about the standard claim. Um, and you might already be familiar with this, um, but the real problem in a lot of sexual harassment cases is not necessarily proving right, that harassment occurred, uh, but it is in holding the employer accountable for it. And um, through a line of cases, the Supreme Court has um, developed the standards for employer liability in which they distinguish between vicarious liability or strict liability where the harasser's actions are imputed to the employer, right? That is, um, this employee harassed, you are automatically responsible, versus direct liability where the employer is liable only for its own wrongdoing that is, the employer is not automatically liable if someone, uh, if an employee is harassed, but we look at whether the employer was negligent, at least negligent, in allowing that harassment to occur. Okay, so the challenge here really is that the employer liability standards are built on a really narrow, really formalistic understanding of the structure of work relationships. And so vicarious or strict liability is only available really, I mean there is technically availability in another situation, but it's only really available when the supervisor, when a supervisor, excuse me, takes a tangible employment action, right? Supervisor, narrowly defined, and tangible employment action, narrowly defined, um, in the following way. So the court has, in that line of cases, defined supervisor as those employees whom the employer has empowered to take tangible employment actions, right? And they said, we want to have this really narrow unitary category because um, that is more administrable, that's more simple. They think somehow this is going to promote um, the protection of rights. And um, tangible employment actions, which you have to be empowered to do, um, in order to be a supervisor, well, that's very narrowly defined as hiring, firing, failing to promote, reassignment with significantly different responsibilities, or a decision causing a significant change in benefits. I mean, almost limited to really serious, ultimate employment actions in certain ways. So that is um, a situation where the employer would be vicariously liable, but really only if the harassment took the form of a tangible employment action, right? So, for example, if um, a quid pro quo harassment occurred where um, the supervisor said, um, you know, have sex with me or else you're going to be fired, and um, the employee doesn't comply and the employee is fired, or something like that, right? 
if no tangible employment action is taken, technically, yes, the employer is still vicariously liable if it's a supervisor who committed the harassment, but there's an affirmative defense that is available, um, and you might be familiar with this as well, um, and this affirmative defense would apply even if there was a quid pro quo pro proposed, right, if it was not fulfilled, right, so if the threat wasn't carried through. Also would apply in the case of a hostile work environment um, claim, the affirmative defense would be available. Okay, so very limited situation in which a, um, an employer would be vicariously liable. Would not apply in the situations that I described earlier. Okay, so first of all, um, even if it is a manager, that would not necessarily um, lead the employer to be held vicariously liable because the definition of supervisor does not include those who are not <coughs> empowered to take tangible employment actions, even if they can control the day-to-day -day schedules and assignments of others. So the example I gave earlier of the manager who cuts your hours or puts you in um, a less lucrative section of the restaurant, um, that person not necessarily um, treated as a supervisor. And certainly customers wouldn't be, and certainly coworkers who don't have that sort of authority, even that much authority over you would not be. So what model would apply in that case? Well, that would be direct liability. Um, that applies to harassment by non-supervisory employees and third parties such as customers. And in that situation, the employer is liable for its own wrongdoing, that is negligence in controlling work conditions, um, meaning if the employer knew or should have known about the conduct and failed to stop it. And Justice Ginsburg dissenting to um, the court's line of reasoning um, in the Vance case said, this is a very employer friendly standard, right? Because it really requires the employer to be on notice in order to have any responsibility for the harassment. And that's a problem, right, in a lot of workplaces because a lot of times people don't want to complain um, when they are subject to harassment. We know this, there are studies that show this, um, and um, that's what Justice Ginsburg pointed out, right? If no complaint makes its way up to management, um, no liability. Well, if you think about it, are complaints going to make their way up to management in the situation that I'm describing, right? That tipped server in a restaurant is not going to complain. And that's one of the big problems um, that tipping exacerbates. And that is, first of all, you're not going to even oppose sexual harassment by customers unless you want to lose your tips. You're not going to complain about it to management, right? Because then you're making the um, customer unhappy and also you're making management unhappy because another thing that they found is management does not tend to back up servers when customers behave abusively towards them because there's this whole culture in the service industry of customer sovereignty, right? The customer is king, the customer is always right. We don't want to make our customers unhappy. And so a lot of managers will actually admonish the server who complains and also, going along with that and exacerbating it is management kind of tries to promote sometimes the sexualization of their servers, even in non-sexualized restaurant environments, right? So they advise their servers, um, you know, smile more, look pretty, dress, you know, in a way that makes you seem available, even in, you know, what you would not consider to be a Hooters type environment. So not going to complain about customers. Um, employer not going to get noticed. Are you going to complain about the manager? Or are you going to complain about your coworkers' harassment? No, you're not going to do that either, right? Because, as mentioned earlier, they also can control your ability to get tips by sabotaging your work, um, by assigning you to unattractive um, shifts, and so forth. So again, reliance on tips makes matters even worse than they would be in another work environment. So, what can we do about this? Well, as you might have gathered, I think the reliance on tips is a huge part of the problem. I'm not saying it's the 
only cause of the problem of sexual harassment of workers because again, um, in other service contexts, workers are subject to sexual harassment and we know that in many work environments, this um, is a problem. But tipping does seem to make the problem worse and the glass floor study found um, that indeed it does, right? Because um, especially in states where servers get the subminimum wage, it's worse than in states where they rely on tips, but their minimum wage is a little bit higher. So the reason why um, I think we need to focus on tipping itself and not necessarily the individual behavior of um, the perpetrators, right, but the practice of relying on tips is because it affects servers' incentives, it affects the behavior of other people in the workplace, right? It makes the work environment worse for those who rely on tips because it promotes and facilitates harassment by customers and coworkers. And so what I'm interested in exploring, um, and I think this is gonna be challenging, but I would like to try it, is um, to develop a disparate impact claim based on a particular employment practice that is the practice of relying on tips to compensate your employees. And um, the disparate impact claim you know, has many um, components to it, um, but I'm gonna focus on um, ideas for making out the prima facie case, which requires a plaintiff to show that a particular employment practice causes a disparate impact, right? And this is a very challenging um, thing to accomplish, and that's where the empirical research project that I mentioned in the handout is going to come into play. Um, I think it's always challenging. It's gonna be even more challenging to develop a disparate impact claim in this context because um, it's not your typical disparate impact claim, right? We usually think of disparate impact as um, challenging selection criteria, right? Height and weight rules. Um, or tests that you have to um, perform at a certain level on in order to get a job, or maybe a, um, you know, a rule or policy that affects um, a certain group adversely um, in a disproportionate way. Here, the challenge is, um, again, going back to the structure of service work, the challenge is that the reason why the particular employment practice causes a disparate impact um, is because it affects the behavior of other people. Um, and so that's where it's gonna get tricky to try to figure out a way to make that argument. And so here's where I'm thinking. First of all, some scholars have said that we ought to view the hostile work environment as a harm, not as a different type of claim, right? So that other stuff that I was showing you earlier about um, the employer liability standards that apply when you make a claim of sexual harassment, these scholars would say, that's just employer liability standards for discrimination in the workplace. Sexual harassment is really just a type of harm that can occur to you in the workplace, right? Like being terminated or you know, being given um, duties that are um, especially burdensome or something like that. Really, we should think about hostile environment as a harm and approach liability for that harm the same way we would approach liability for other harms. And so thinking about it that way, there are a couple of um, lines of cases. Um, they're not numerous. They're not your standard disparate impact types of cases. Um, but I think they could provide analogies for the problem that I'm interested in. So the first one, and again, it's not a perfect fit. Neither of these is. But I'll tell you why I think they're somewhat of a fit, is um, a case out of the Tenth Circuit, Maldonado v. City of Altus. Um, allowed a claim to go forward challenging an employer's English only policy because of the impact of the policy on the work environment. Um, and so what the court said in that case was um, that a hostile work environment could be challenged under a disparate impact theory, right? So that was um, controversial. The court, the Tenth Circuit thought, yes, hostile work environment can be challenged under this theory. And in that case, allowed the claim based on this policy to go forward um, on the basis that a fact finder could find that the impact of the English only policy on Hispanic workers was sufficiently severe or pervasive to alter the conditions of their employment and create an abusive working environment. So this case actually is really helpful in one way 
but distinguishable in another way, um, and that is it's helpful in the sense that part of the plaintiff's evidence um, in Maldonado was analogous to what I'm talking about here, and that was it included evidence of how the policy promoted taunting by other employees, and the court said, um, yeah, that's something that would be an expected consequence of the policy, um, and so that's kind of helpful because you could argue, well, if you're gonna rely on tips from your customers to compensate your workers, an expected consequence is that customers are gonna feel entitled to harass your workers and your workers are gonna feel like they have to put up with it. Problem, though, with using the Maldonado case um, as an analogy is it's also distinguishable because that's not the only basis um, on which the court allowed the disparate impacts claim to go forward. The court also said um, that it wasn't just the effect of the policy in that case, but the very policy itself that created the hostile work environment, right? The very fact that the city would forbid Hispanics from using their preferred language could reasonably be construed as an expression of hostility to Hispanics. Really can't say that about tipping, I don't think, um, because even though it has bad effects, the um, you know the policy itself is not expressing any hostility. But maybe this point could be helpful um, from Maldonado because the court also pointed out ways in which an English-only policy imposed burdens on employees with little or no English language skills because it put them at a greater risk of violating the rules and being disciplined. So one point that maybe um, could be made to compare the two, uh, the two situations is that a tipping policy puts servers at risk in the sense that it puts them in a bind, right? I either subject myself to harassment or I lose money. So maybe Bringing in this other line of cases um, could bolster a claim um, for disparate impact, and that is um, there are some cases that have found that inadequate restroom facilities um, would support a disparate impact claim because they have disparate adverse health effects on women. So let me tell you about Lynch v. Freeman, um, in which the court found for the plaintiff, it re reversed the district court's judgment for the defendant, and found for the plaintiff on a disparate impact claim based on inadequate unsanitary restroom facilities that were provided to construction workers. So basically, uh, you know, it was outdoor construction work. They had porta potties for all the workers. Uh, the men were fine with that, but for women, it was a real problem because um, what the evidence showed was that women were more vulnerable to adverse health effects from having to use these unsanitary facilities. Um, including such things as urinary tract infections, right, which the men did not have to worry about. And the court said that working conditions, so the <laughs> Maldonado court said hostile work environment can be the basis of a claim. Lynch said working conditions can be the basis of a disparate impact claim. And the inadequate facilities had a disparate impact on women because the employer created an unacceptable situation in which the plaintiff and other female construction workers were required to choose between submitting to a discriminatory health risk <coughs> or risking termination for disobeying a company rule. And what they were doing in order to avoid the health risk was they were actually leaving the job site, going into the building, using the clean indoor restroom, and they were being disciplined for doing that, right? And so what the court was saying was, um, you're putting the women workers in this bind where they're either gonna risk their health or they're gonna risk being disciplined. Um, again, not a perfect analogy because this case doesn't involve the conduct of other people. But I think you can make the argument that um, tipping, like the unsanitary uh, restaurant restroom facilities, creates an unacceptable situation for women servers because it forces them to choose, again, between submitting to sexual harassment or losing compensation. Another thing that um, <coughs> the second, um, line of cases makes me think about, although it really wasn't part of the court's decision, is uh, whether the work conditions having a disparate impact on women 
affects their ability to perform the work, right, which in turn affects their compensation. And my thinking here is that it's really creating an additional burden for women servers to bear that male servers don't have to bear, right? So in addition to all of the difficult work of restaurant service itself, right? You gotta take the orders, remember the orders, you have all this physical labor involved, there's cleaning up and shoveling things back and forth, plus you have to do all the emotional labor, right, of being nice to people. Now you also have to worry about dodging the sexual harassment, contending with the sexual harassment. It's an extra cognitive load that could affect your ability to actually do the parts of your job that are legitimately parts of your job on which your tips also depend. Um, and so that's where the empirical research project that I mentioned I think is going to come into play and be helpful. Um, and um, that is I'm proposing a research project with some other faculty from a, around Pitt and at another university who are social scientists who study these kinds of issues, right? Work conditions, precarious work, and so forth. And um, I think that the research <coughs> will uncover um, ways that we can support the claim, at least I hope it will, um, that we should be able to show that relying on gratuities from customers to compensate servers um, is a particular employment practice that has a disparate adverse impact on women. So. That is my project, and thanks for listening to it, and I really look forward to hearing your thoughts. Um, again, it's in early stages, and I'm all ears. <laughs> so. The question that I'm, as you're going through it, I enjoyed your talk, but as you're going through this, um, maybe I should put this in terms I'm 70 years old. Okay. Would you describe for me what, if in the, in a situation of a restaurant. Uh -huh. Not the obvious situation, but maybe something that would not be obvious to me, uh -huh. my generation, but is sexual harassment waitress friends. Oh, yeah. So um, they actually, in this report that I was telling you about, um, they defined it um, as in a particular way. And I think it's good to look at their definition because it, it gives you an example of um, what they meant. Um, unwelcome sexual advances, requests for sexual favors, and verbal or physical conduct of a sexual nature. So there's a lot of reporting in here of um, touching and grabbing, propositioning, stalking, sexting, that sort of thing. Let me, let me give you an example I discussed okay. with my niece. Okay. Okay, so she's their generation, let's say. Uh, there's a waitress. The customer says to the waitress, Gee, I, I really like that outfit. That really looks very nice on you. Uh huh. That situation. Is that would that? You know, obviously touching. I understand all that. But let's say this customer says to the waitress, "Well, you know that outfit. Really, you really look very nice in that outfit." Yeah. So I'm not sure that would meet the definition of sexual harassment. The problem with that kind of a comment is. Um, that it really is part of the culture of restaurants. And that's a, a, another thing that was really interesting um, that came out of this report, although this report was not the first um, place to um, publish this information. Sociologists who studied restaurant work for decades have found the environment in restaurants is really highly gendered and sexualized. So the expectation, and I didn't really go into this very much in the talk, but the expectation um, that is placed on women's servers and not on men is they actually have to seem like they are available as sexual objects, right? Um, in order to please customers, or at least management thinks this pleases customers. And so that's why in some places, um, and also it tends to correlate with the places where they're more, um, their compensation is less secure. Um, they have to wear sexy uniforms, even if it's not a Hooters. Um, <coughs> they have to, um, sort of flirt and that sort of thing. And so the situation you're describing, I don't think would meet the definition of sexual harassment, right? So I'm not saying that you should be able to sue on the basis of that. But that's problematic in itself, that type of behavior, because I mean, that's just the way it is in restaurants and that promotes and makes the rest of it, which is more egregious, seem normal. That would probably make the waitress feel uncomfortable. Yes, right. Whereas you wouldn't, you wouldn't say to a man, 
wow, you really look good in that outfit. You know what I mean? I, I've never well, heard Well, and I guess it's the you. way you say it, too, could be different. Um, and I think the discomfort, you know, that's a burden that is sort of a lower level burden, but it's a constant burden. Yes, Debbie. Uh, well, I thank you. I think this is a wonderful project, um, and you put so much out there and have so many thoughts about it that I want to talk to you about. But just one thing that, um, that I wonder about is whether if you shift the lens, or at least, or maybe broaden the lens, <coughs> about pay discrimination, if that helps it. Um, because it seems to me that they're so interrelated here. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I mean, all of your critique about employment discrimination law applies to pay too that pay discrimination has been developed as the, the dyad that you're talking about, the employer pays the worker the mm -hmm. wages. And so both models of Title VII and the Equal Pay Act are built on that. Mm -hmm. And of course this is very different, but it seems like especially you know, moving more and more toward a model of work where the customer has a role in what people are paid, pay laws too have to be broad enough to capture that triangle. So one thing that occurred to me, um, well, a couple of things. You know, the Equal Pay Act, <clears throat> people have to be do, paid the same to do the same work. Mm -hmm. Waiters and waitresses, wait staff are doing the same work. But where sexual harassment intervenes to suppress pay, they're being paid differently. And it, you know, one of the defenses is, is it a factor other than sex? That shouldn't be a factor other than sex. That is so interrelated to sex. And any factor based on sex or other than sex should be based on a legitimate business practice. And maybe that's a hook for challenging whether tipping really is um, the kind of uh, the, the, the defense is sort of moving into more of a business necessity thing. Mm -hmm. of, you know, maybe we should be scrutinizing under that defense too whether tipping is really important enough to do. And then the other thing that occurred to me for um, the Title VII pay claim. Courts have been really resistant to disparate impact models mm -hmm. to challenge pay, largely because of anxiety about comparable work. Mm -hmm. But this isn't an instance here. This is, um, as you say, the, the practice that would be having the disparate impact on pay would be um, the practice of tipping having such a role in setting real wages. Mm -hmm. And it's not opening the door to comparable work. So this mm -hmm. seems like an area where courts might be more receptive to disparate impact pay claims than they typically are. So I just wondered if you, I mean, it's more, more common than a question, obviously, but I, but I wonder if you are, if your project has to be focused just on the sexual harassment in terms of legal claims, or if you might broaden it to think about pay claims. So it doesn't have to be um, that narrow. Um, this is just, you know, a starting point. And I think that um, that's actually where I'm excited about the empirical project that we're doing is because we're looking at sexual harassment as part of a larger picture um, with regard to just the precarity of the work itself. And so we're looking at a whole bunch of factors. How does it um, play out in the workplace? How just the fact that they're dependent on tips, um, what's the difference for men and women in terms of not just sexual harassment, but um, how does it affect the rest of their lives? How do they plan for things? What social factors in the work environment exacerbate or lessen the problems? Um, and so I would very much be open. And um, and you have promised to talk to me more about this. And we will. Okay, great. Rhonda. So maybe this is part of your empirical project, but I'm curious to know whether there's been any study of work restaurant environments where tipping has been abolished and the employer, the, the restaurant just charges a higher price and then increases the wage and in that environment is there less sexual harassment than in the environment where tipping is part of it? So that is the study that I would like to do and um, the no tipping policies are relatively new and they're not very widespread and so the research so far has been actually more relevant, I think, to the business necessity defense. Um, there is a, a researcher at Cornell who has made a whole career of studying tipping, and he's starting to look at the differences for restaurants um, in terms of their profitability of the tipping versus no tipping policy. And so I think that would play into what Debbie was um, talking about is you could anticipate with disparate impact um, the employer saying, well, no, we have to have a tipping policy, right? Because, whoops, wrong slide, sorry. Um, because, <laughs> sorry, 
there we go. Uh, job related and consistent with business necessity. I think they could make a lot of arguments like, well, it helps to ensure service quality because of the incentives and customers, and actually this is true, customers really like having control over tips. Um, and actually some servers say, we don't want to give up tips. We don't like being paid a standard wage because some servers actually view themselves as entrepreneurs and think, oh, I have these great strategies for getting higher tips and I don't want to be paid the same as others. Um, so there, the no tipping versus tipping studies have tended to focus more on the business side, but one of the things that we want to look at in the empirical work going forward is, so what's the difference for, our, um, especially burdensome or something like that? Really, we should think about hostile environment as a harm and approach liability for that harm the same way we would approach liability for other harms. And so thinking about it that way, there are a couple of um, lines of cases. Um, they're not numerous. They're not your standard uh, disparate impact types of cases. Uh, but I think they could provide analogies for the problem that I'm interested in. So the first one, and again, it's not a perfect fit. Neither of these is, but I'll tell you why I think they're somewhat of a fit is um, a case out of the Tenth Circuit, Maldonado v. City of Altus, um, allowed a claim to go forward challenging an employer's English-only policy because of the impact of the policy on the work environment. Um, and so what the court said in that case was um, that a hostile work environment could be challenged under a disparate impact theory, right? So that was um, controversial. The court, the Tenth Circuit thought, yes, hostile work environment can be challenged under this theory. And in that case, allowed the claim based on this policy to go forward um, on the basis that a fact finder could find that the impact of the English only policy on Hispanic workers was sufficiently severe or pervasive to alter the conditions of their employment and create an abusive working environment. So this case actually is really helpful in one way, but distinguishable in another way, um, and that is it's helpful in the sense that part of the plaintiff's evidence um, in Maldonado was analogous to what I'm talking about here, and that was it included evidence of how the policy promoted taunting by other employees, and the court said, um, yeah, that's something that would be an expected consequence of the policy, um, and so that's kind of helpful because you could argue, well, if you're going to rely on tips from your customers to compensate your workers, an expected consequence is that customers are going to feel entitled to harass your workers and your workers are going to feel like they have to put up with it. Problem, though, with using the Maldonado case um, as an analogy is it's also distinguishable because that's not the only basis um, on which the court allowed the disparate impact claim to go forward. The court also said um, that it wasn't just the effect of the policy in that case, but the very policy itself that created the hostile work environment, right? The very fact that the city would forbid Hispanics from using their preferred language could reasonably be construed as an expression of hostility to Hispanics. Really can't say that about tipping, I don't think, um, because even though it has bad effects, the um, you know the policy itself is not expressing any hostility. But maybe this point could be helpful um, from Maldonado because the court also pointed out ways in which an English-only policy imposed burdens on employees with little or no English language skills because it put them at a greater risk of violating the rules and being disciplined. So one point that maybe um, could be made to compare the two, uh, the two situations is that a tipping policy puts servers at risk in the sense that it puts them in a bind, right? I either subject myself to harassment or I lose money. So maybe, Bringing in this other line of cases um, could bolster a claim um, for disparate impact, and that is um, there are some cases that have found that inadequate restroom facilities um, would support a disparate impact claim because they have disparate adverse health effects on women. So let me tell you about Lynch v. Freeman, 
um, in which the court found for the plaintiff, it re reversed the district court's judgment for the defendant and found for the plaintiff on a disparate impact claim based on inadequate unsanitary restroom facilities that were provided to construction workers. So basically, um, you know, it was outdoor construction work. They had porta potties for all the workers. Um, the men were fine with that. But for women, it was a real problem because um, what the evidence showed was that women were more vulnerable to adverse health effects from having to use these unsanitary facilities, um, including such things as urinary tract infections, right, which the men did not have to worry about. And the court said that working conditions, so the <coughs> Maldonado court said hostile work environment can be the basis of a claim. Lynch said working conditions can be the basis of a disparate impact claim, and the inadequate facilities had a disparate impact on women because the employer created an unacceptable situation in which the plaintiff and other female construction workers were required to choose between submitting to a discriminatory health risk <coughs> or risking termination for disobeying a company rule. And what they were doing in order to avoid the health risk was they were actually leaving the job site, going into the building, using the clean indoor restroom, and they were being disciplined for doing that, right? And so what the court was saying was, um, you're putting the women workers in this bind where they're either gonna risk their health or they're gonna risk being disciplined. Um, again, not a perfect analogy because this case doesn't involve the conduct of other people. But I think you can make the argument that um, tipping, like the unsanitary um, restaurant, restroom facilities, creates an unacceptable situation for women servers because it forces them to choose, again, between submitting to sexual harassment or losing compensation. Another thing that um, the second um, line of cases makes me think about, although it really wasn't part of the court's decision, is uh, whether the work conditions having a disparate impact on women affects their ability to perform the work, right, which in turn affects their compensation. And my thinking here is that it's really creating an additional burden for women servers to bear that male servers don't have to bear, right? So in addition to all of the difficult work of restaurant service itself, right, you gotta take the orders, remember the orders, you have all this physical labor involved, there's cleaning up and shoveling things back and forth, Plus, you have to do all the emotional labor, right, of being nice to people. Now you also have to worry about dodging the sexual harassment, contending with the sexual harassment. It's an extra cognitive load that could affect your ability to actually do the parts of your job that are legitimately parts of your job on which your tips also depend. Um, and so that's where the empirical research project that I mentioned I think is going to come into play and be helpful. Um, and um, that is I'm proposing a research project with some other faculty from a, around Pitt and at another university who are social scientists who study these kinds of issues, right? Work conditions, precarious work, and so forth. And um, I think that the research <coughs> will uncover um, ways that we can support the claim, at least I hope it will, um, that we should be able to show that relying on gratuities from customers to compensate servers um, is a particular employment practice that has a disparate adverse impact on women. So that is my project, and thanks for listening to it, and I really look forward to hearing your thoughts. Um, again, it's in early stages, and um, all ears. <laughs> so. The question that I'm, as you're going through it, I enjoyed your talk, but as you're going through this, um, maybe I should put this in terms I'm 70 years old. Okay. Would you describe for me what, if in the in a situation of a restaurant, uh -huh. not the obvious situation, but maybe something that would not be obvious to me, uh -huh. my generation, what is sexual harassment? Oh, yeah. So um, they actually, in this report that I was telling you about, um, they defined it um, as in a particular way. And I think it's good to look at their definition because it, it gives you an example of um, what they meant. Um, 
unwelcome sexual advances, requests for sexual favors, and verbal or physical conduct of a sexual nature. So there's a lot of reporting in here of um, touching and grabbing, propositioning, stalking, sexting, that sort of thing. Let me, let me give you an example I discussed okay. with my niece. Okay. Okay, so she's their generation, let's say. Uh, there's a waitress. The customer says to the waitress, gee, I, I really like that outfit. That really looks very nice on you. Uh-huh. Not that situation. Is that, would that, you know, obviously touching, I understand all that, but let's say this customer says to the waitress, well, you know that outfit really, you really look very nice in that outfit. Yeah, so I'm not sure that would meet the definition of sexual harassment. The problem with that kind of a comment is um, that it really is part of the culture of restaurants. And that's a, a, another thing that was really interesting um, that came out of this report, although this report was not the first um, place to um, publish this information. Sociologists who studied restaurant work for decades have found the environment in restaurants is really highly gendered and sexualized. So the expectation, and I didn't really go into this very much in the talk, but the expectation um, that is placed on women servers and not on men is they actually have to seem like they are available as sexual objects, right? Um, in order to please customers, or at least management thinks this pleases customers. And so that's why in some places, um, and also it tends to correlate with the places where they're more, um, their compensation is less secure. Um, they have to wear sexy uniforms, even if it's not a Hooters. Um, <coughs> they have to um, sort of flirt and that sort of thing. And so the situation you're describing, I don't think would meet the definition of sexual harassment, right? So I'm not saying that you should be able to sue on the basis of that. But that's problematic in itself, that type of behavior, because, I mean, that's just the way it is in restaurants, and that promotes and makes the rest of it, which is more egregious, seem normal. That would probably make the waitress feel uncomfortable, I would think. Yes, right. Whereas you wouldn't, you wouldn't say to a man, wow, you really look good in that outfit. You know what I mean? I, I've never well, heard Well, and I guess it's the way you say it, too, could be different. Um, and I think the discomfort, you know, that's a burden that is sort of a lower level burden, but it's a constant burden. Yes, Debbie. Uh, well, I thank you. I think this is a wonderful project, um, and you put so much out there, and have so many thoughts about it that I want to talk to you about. But just one thing that um, that I wonder about is whether, if you shift the lens, or at least, or maybe broaden the lens <coughs> about pay discrimination, if that helps it, because um, it seems to me that they're so interrelated here. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I mean, all of your critique about employment discrimination law applies to pay too that pay discrimination has been developed as the, the dyad that you're talking about, the employer pays the worker the wages. And so both models of Title VII and the Equal Pay Act are built on that. Mm -hmm. And of course this is very different, but it seems like especially you know, moving more and more toward a model of work where the customer has a role in what people are paid, pay laws too have to be broad enough to capture that triangle. So one thing that occurred to me, um, well, a couple of things. You know, the Equal Pay Act, <clears throat> people have to be do, paid the same to do the same work. Mm -hmm. Waiters and waitresses, wait staff are doing the same work. But where sexual harassment intervenes to suppress pay, they're being paid differently. And it, you know, one of the defenses is, is it a factor other than sex? That shouldn't be a factor other than sex. That is so interrelated to sex. And any factor based on sex or other than sex should be based on a legitimate business practice. And maybe that's a hook for challenging whether tipping really is um, the kind of, I mean, the, the defense is sort of moving into more of a business necessity thing. Mm -hmm. of, you know, maybe we should be scrutinizing under that defense too, whether tipping is really important enough to do. And then the other thing that occurred to me for uh, the Title VII pay claim, the courts have been really resistant to disparate impact models mm -hmm. to challenge pay, largely because of anxiety about comparable work. Mm -hmm. But this isn't an instance here. This is, um, as you say, the, the practice that would be having the disparate impact on pay would be um, the practice of tipping having such a role in setting real wages. Mm -hmm. And it's not opening the door to comparable work. So this mm -hmm. seems like an area where courts might be more receptive to disparate impact pay claims than they typically are. So I just wondered if you, I mean, it's more, more a confident question, obviously, but I, 
but I wonder if you are, if your project has to be focused just on the sexual harassment in terms of legal claims, or if you might broaden it to think about pay claims. So it doesn't have to be um, that narrow. Um, this is just, you know, a starting point. And I think that um, that's actually where I'm excited about the empirical project that we're doing is because we're looking at sexual harassment as part of a larger picture um, with regard to just the precarity of the work itself. And so we're looking at a whole bunch of factors. How does it um, play out in the workplace? How just the fact that they're dependent on tips, um, what's the difference for men and women in terms of not just sexual harassment, but um, how does it affect the rest of their lives? How do they plan for things? What social factors in the work environment exacerbate or lessen the problems? Um, and so I would very much be open and um, and you have promised to talk to me more about this. And we will. Okay, great. Bronta. So maybe this is part of your empirical project, but I'm curious to know whether there's been any study of work restaurant environments where tipping has been abolished and the employer, the, the restaurant just charges a higher price and then increases the wage. And in that environment, is there less? sexual harassment than in the environment where tipping is part of it. So that is the study that I would like to do. And um, the no tipping policies are relatively new and they're not very widespread. And so the research so far has been actually more relevant, I think, to the business necessity defense. Um, there is a, a researcher at Cornell who has made a whole career of studying tipping. And he's starting to look at the differences for restaurants um, in terms of their profitability of the tipping versus no tipping policy. And so I think that would play into what Debbie was um, talking about is you could anticipate with disparate impact um, the employer saying, well, no, we have to have a tipping policy, right? Because, whoops, wrong slide, sorry. Um, because, <laughs> sorry, there we go. Um, job related and consistent with business necessity. I think they could make a lot of arguments like, well, it helps to ensure service quality because of the incentives and customers, and actually this is true, customers really like having control over tips, um, and actually some servers say we don't want to give up tips, we don't like being paid a standard wage because some servers actually view themselves as entrepreneurs and think, oh, I have these great strategies for getting higher tips and I don't want to be paid the same as others. Um, so there, the no tipping versus tipping studies have tended to focus more on the business side, but one of the things that we want to look at in the empirical work going forward is, so what's the difference for workers um, in terms of their conditions? Debbie, did you have Same question. Okay, same <laughs> question. Yes, Vincent. Yes, Lorena. Um, you had talked a bit about social factors. I was just curious, are you going to look at race as a cultural identity and its interplay with the frequency of sexual harassment or the amount of tipping someone does or doesn't receive? So um, we are going to look, and we're going to put into the study demographic factors, including race, age also for sexual harassment um, could be a factor. And this is interesting. I have a lot to say about race in just a second. But um, on age, this is interesting. One of my um, team members has a sister who are, uh, sisters who, has a sister who are, sisters who are both career restaurant servers, and they are older now, they're nearing retirement, and she said their attitude about sexual harassment is so different from the younger um, servers because they're just like, it's part of the job, put up with it, you know, if you want the tips, you're gonna have to deal with that, and these young people are too soft. And so we wanna see what the difference is in terms of reactions, based on age and, and in terms of strategies. But in terms of race, yes, we are interested in seeing that. Um, and you had asked about um, whether that affects the size of tips. There are studies on that. Um, not very many, but studies show that actually servers of color receive lower tips um, than white servers. Um, women tend to receive lower tips than male servers, right? So aside from the harassment issues. Another thing that um, one of my research partners and I are working on currently is the restaurant environment is not just highly sexualized, it's also highly racialized. And um, what that takes the form of is it's a very segregated work environment. And so actually you don't, you don't have a lot of front of the house workers um, who are people of color. It's really mostly white 
servers and hosts. And um, people of color tend to be in the back of the house. And also, there's a lot of um, racial talk in restaurants. They um, refer to it as the culture of white servers. There's a lot of racial talk about customers of color. But it's interesting, um, a recent study said, but the workers in the back of the house reported, oh, we don't really hear that. And it's because they're keeping it right among the servers. And so the project that I mentioned earlier where um, I'm talking about dignity being the currency of a transaction is looking at how the dignity of customers is affected by dependence on tips, right? Because there's all these stereotypes around customers tipping even, um, and servers are motivated <coughs> by tips that they sort of translate their stereotypes about tipping into behavior in the backstage among themselves, which translates into this service that they provide customers of color, which is not as hospitable, like they withhold that emotional labor. So there's a whole lot of interesting stuff in restaurants. Grant. Um, you, you talk about tip versus no tip. I'm curious if, if you've looked at um, individual tip versus pooled tips. And in pooled tips in particular, when you think about disparate impact, I wonder if they're, oh, it's not a problem, we pool our tips. So to the extent it impacts anyone, it impacts everyone. I'm just curious. Yeah, we do um, want to look at the difference. I think, though, um, it would only be a difference in terms of the average compensation would be shared by everyone. I'm not sure it would change the work conditions because I think customers <coughs> would still feel the way they feel, right? Um, it might change the behavior of coworkers because they're only hurting their own tips if they sabotage the server's performance. Um, but I don't think that it would affect the behavior <coughs> of customers, although that is one question we're going to look at. Okay. Yes? Just curious. Um, I've spent a decent bit of time in France over the last couple of summers, and one of the things, I mean, they don't tip at all. Uh -huh. um, and the interesting thing there to me, and you know, obviously I'm not of the culture, so I don't know, but it always seems that there is a deeper respect there of uh -huh. the uh, folks that work there. Um, there. And there's a different way that you, when, uh, when I talk to students who are going out to restaurants, is that you don't like call people and tell them, uh -huh. because the waiters there, it's their profession, and they know when to come, and there, there's a certain aspect to that. And I was wondering if you've thought about doing any kind of cultural aspect, since there is no tipping there, and then, most other, I think most other right. places. So, a couple of things there. Um, first of all, yes, I think you're right, is that um, tipping sort of deprofessionalizes the work. And um, there was a movement um, among the Pullman porters to actually, way back um, when they were heavily dependent on tips, to actually abolish tipping, even though they were hurting their own compensation because they felt it was very degrading. Um, and that is, and actually the history of tipping in the United States is really interesting because when it first was introduced, there were actually laws against tipping because the argument was, well, you're really creating a servile class um, by having, you know, sort of the superior give these gratuities to the inferior. So there is that history, and I think you're right that that could make a big difference in terms of um, going to a no tipping model. It really is, you're being paid a salary, and you get benefits, and it's a professional job. But interesting you should mention France, because some of the studies showing how sexist customers are actually come out of France, because even though- that, That's what I was thinking. Yeah, yeah. Okay, even though good. tipping is not um, you know, as big there, there is sort of like giving token um, you know, uh, right. amounts. Yes, they do. That's right? right. Um, and they have done some studies there that show that women servers got higher token amounts when they wore makeup, when they wore like a red shirt versus a different color shirt, and um, you know, men it was pretty steady. Right. So, so it's pretty Yeah, so there's like any window you give people, I guess, they'll take. <laughs> Pat. Um, I might have missed this at the very beginning because I wasn't able to hear the very beginning, but I wondered if there, uh, it might, um, there might be analogous uh, kinds of jobs to the, that, that you can draw from, see if there's research, but uh, commission jobs, uh, mm -hmm. where, where uh, of course, the compensation is based on the customer's response to whether or not they purchase or not. And particularly in commission jobs, where there might also be sex segregation, 
Um, so, you know, the, the men are the bosses. The women go out and do the sales, and uh, their jobs are dependent on commissions. And I, I'm thinking, I don't know if they still have that in, the, in some of the um, houseware industries and some of the makeup industries, et cetera, uh, where it's commission-based sales. Uh, but they certainly still have commission arrangements. And I'm, yeah. I, there might be some parallels there. I think there would be, and I, um, I think the whole commission thing is interesting too because of the Sears case in um, employment discrimination law where actually the better jobs were the commission sales and those tended to be men and the argument that the employer said um, justified that sex segregation was, oh, well, women don't want to take the risk of being paid by commission. But nowadays, I think maybe it's different um, and that would be a good analogy. Um, and that sort of ties into the whole role of the customer, right, in terms of determining the conditions <coughs> of employment is, again, really the customer is playing a bigger role than we account for in our traditional legal understanding. So that's a great idea. And also, I don't know to the extent you want to expand the definition of sexual harassment beyond the sex-driven, you know, uh, sex-related and move it into the insults, sort of the, the sometimes called gender harassment kinds of practices. Um, but if so, there's some interesting, uh, you know, there's some interesting information on that as well. So you mean like just um, sort of like hostility towards women? That's yeah, kind of like Nikki yeah. Schultz and her work on yeah. how. Uh, um, that really, if you think of sexual harassment as a means for domination uh, uh, and, and, and the flip subordination, then, uh, it, uh, then sex-related actions are really just a subsample or a, a subset of things that can be done for individuals to maintain that dominant position. But things like insult, well, like pri even Price Waterhouse goes way back, but it illustrates the kind of, uh, of uh, practices that can be done. And Price Waterhouse, of course, was not conceived as a sexual harassment case, but I think in today's world, one could imagine it could be a kind of sexual harassment case. Yeah, I think you're right. And um, we haven't designed this, the survey yet, or um, the, done the interviews yet, because we're waiting to get funding. But, um, <laughs> but we could include questions about gender-based insults. We also could include questions about racial insults, um, because in some of these settings with service work in general, um, there is literature that shows that customers and patients treat service and health service workers differently based on race and gender because they think it's okay, right? Like, or they view them as being more servile than a male performing the same job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And are you familiar with the EEOC report on sexual harassment? Uh, uh, there was a task force on yeah, did it come out recently, like in the last year? I think, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. But anyways, there's a, they, 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 uh, they have decided to define what they study as sexual harassment in this broader sense. And, and so there might be some interesting things there to draw from as well. Okay, thanks. Um, I don't know if Pam, you had your hand up way back. Okay. Oh, yes. Yeah. In, the, uh, in the construction worker case, was, was there a standard about the level of, of sanitation of the facilities that were being offered? Certainly I can understand from an employer perspective why you might be concerned about people coming on and off a job site uh -huh. while, they're, while you're compensating them, I suppose. It, it strikes me that that seems like it would be something that would be Right, and, and they, right, exactly. I mean, certainly I can understand that yeah. there would be more pressure on biology and, and comfort mm -hmm. and cleanliness, but it would seem that you would be able to provide adequate facilities. I mean, was there a, was there a per se standard that the employer was accused of not me meeting, or did they try and defend on an OSHA standard, or <coughs> the practice of, you know, white <coughs> flush and... Mr. John and so they I mean they basically had Mr. John um, and they were sort of your usual 
conditions at those. <laughs> I could read from the opinion if you would like, but anyway, um, they they were, you know, just your standard porta potties on a construction site, and um, so I think the employer, first of all, didn't view um, work conditions as something that should be the basis of a disparate impact claim, and the court said work conditions can be, um, and. Uh, they offered no evidence of business necessity. Their position was they weren't discriminating because she had access to the same facilities as the men. So they, they weren't trying to justify what they were doing. They were just saying, she, everybody gets this, we're not treating her worse. So I don't think they were trying to defend their facilities. Yeah. And and, and, and her, yeah, okay, so it was, there was no, it was sort of, sort of sort of a matter of opinion about whether that facility was adequate. I don't think the question was whether the facility was adequate. I think the question was whether it was, it had a disparate impact. Like, so do these really bad um, facilities affect women worse than men? That was the question that the case was focusing on. They weren't trying to say these facilities are in any way adequate. They were just saying, we're not discriminating, right? And um, it doesn't impose a disparate impact. It does not, and the district court agreed with them and determined that the unsanitary and inadequate toilet facilities did not impose a substantial burden on women that men need not suffer. So nobody was disputing these were really bad facilities. So, I mean, is the idea is kind of this unspoken idea is that um, men and women use bathrooms differently, right? And so it might, it might be, in fact, not safe and hygienic <laughs> for women, whereas it would be for men, and hence the disparate impact. I mean, well, right. So that's yeah. why the court said she has stated a claim. Yeah, yeah. It's because you're putting this burden on the women who work there, and there weren't very many women. It was a construction site in the 80s. Um, and the employer was saying, this is what we provide our construction workers and, you know, deal with it. Well, uh, that's a funny note to end yes. on. Yes. <laughs> nonetheless, nonetheless. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> nonetheless, thank you. And I hope uh, uh, you got some good ideas. And I know we, I we really uh, appreciate it and enjoy your talk. So thank you. Workers uh, in terms of their conditions. Question. Okay, <laughs> same question. Yes, Vincent. Yes, Luann. Um, you had talked a bit about social factors. I was just curious are you going to look at race as a cultural identity and its interplay with the frequency of sexual harassment or the amount of tipping someone does or doesn't receive? So um, we are going to look, we're going to put into the study demographic factors including race, age also for sexual harassment um, could be a factor and this is interesting. I have a lot to say about race in just a second. But um, on age, this is interesting. One of my um, team members has a sister who are, uh, sisters who has a sister who are, sisters who are both career restaurant servers and they are older now, they're nearing retirement. And she said their attitude about sexual harassment is so different from the younger um, servers because they're just like it's part of the job put up with it you know if you want the tips you're gonna have to deal with that and these young people are too soft and so we want to see what the difference is in terms of reactions based on age and, and in terms of strategies but in terms of race yes we are interested in seeing that um, and you had asked about um, whether that affects the size of tips there are studies on that um, not very many, but studies show that actually servers of color receive lower tips um, than white servers. Um, women tend to receive lower tips than male servers, right? So aside from the harassment issues. Another thing that um, one of my research partners and I are working on currently is the restaurant environment is not just highly sexualized, it's also highly racialized. And um, what that takes the form of is it's a very segregated work environment so actually, don't, you don't have a lot of front of the house workers um, who are people of color. It's really mostly white servers and hosts 
and um, people of color tend to be in the back of the house. And also, there's a lot of um, racial talk in restaurants. They um, refer to it as the culture of white servers. There's a lot of racial talk about customers of color. But it's interesting, um, a recent study said, but the workers in the back of the house reported, oh, we don't really hear that. And it's because they're keeping it right among the servers. And so the project that I mentioned earlier where um, I'm talking about dignity being the currency of a transaction is looking at how the dignity of customers is affected by dependence on tips, right? Because there's all these stereotypes around customers tipping even, um, and servers are motivated <coughs> by tips that they sort of translate their stereotypes about tipping into behavior in the backstage among themselves, which translates into this service that they provide customers of color, which is not as hospitable, like they withhold that emotional labor. So there's a whole lot of interesting stuff in restaurants. Grant. Um, you talked about tip versus no tip. I'm curious if, if you've looked at um, individual tips versus pooled tips. And in pooled tips in particular, when you think about disparate impact, I wonder if they're, oh, it's not a problem, we pool our tips. So to the extent it impacts anyone, it impacts everyone. I'm just curious. Yeah, we do um, want to look at the difference. I think, though, um, it would only be a difference in terms of the average compensation would be shared by everyone. I'm not sure it would change the work conditions because I think customers <coughs> would still feel the way they feel, right? Um, it might change the behavior of coworkers because they're only hurting their own tips if they sabotage the server's performance. Um, but I don't think that it would affect the behavior <coughs> of customers, although that is one question we're going to look at. Okay. Yes? Just curious. Um, I've spent a decent bit of time in France over the past couple summers, and one of the things, I mean, they don't tip at all. Uh -huh. um, and the interesting thing there to me, and you know, obviously I'm not of the culture, so I don't know, but it always seems that there is a deeper respect there of uh -huh. the uh, folks that work there. Um, there. And there's a different way that you, when, uh, when I talk to students who are going out to restaurants, is that you don't like call people and tell them uh -huh. because the waiters there, it's their profession and they know when to come and there, there's a certain aspect to that. And I was wondering if you thought about doing any kind of cultural aspect since there is no tipping there and then most other, I think most other right. places. Right, so a couple of things there. Um, first of all, yes, I think you're right, is that um, tipping sort of deprofessionalizes the work and um, there was a movement um, among the Pullman porters to actually, way back um, when they were heavily dependent on tips, to actually abolish tipping, even though they were hurting their own compensation because they felt it was very degrading. Right. Uh, and that is, and actually the history of tipping in the United States is really interesting because when it first was introduced, there were actually laws against tipping because the argument was, well, you're really creating a servile class um, by having, you know, sort of the superior give these gratuities to the inferior. So there is that history, and I think you're right that that could make a big difference in terms of um, going to a no tipping model. It really is, you're being paid a salary, and you get benefits, and it's a professional job. But interesting you should mention France, because some of the studies showing how sexist customers are actually come out of France, because even though... That, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, <laughs> even though tipping is not, um, you know, as big there, there is sort of like giving token, um, you know, uh, amounts. Yes, they do. That's right? right. Um, and they have done some studies there that show that women servers got higher token amounts when they wore makeup, when they wore like a red shirt versus a different color shirt, and um, you know, men, it was pretty steady. Right. So, so it's pretty yeah. So there's like any window you give people, I guess they'll take. <laughs> Pat, um, I might have missed this at the very beginning because I wasn't able to hear the very beginning. But I wondered if there, uh, it might, um, there might be analogous uh, kinds of jobs to the, that that you can draw from. See if there's research, but uh, commission jobs. Uh, mm -hmm. Where, where, uh, of course, the compensation is based on the customer's response to whether or not they purchase or not, and particularly in commission jobs, where there might also be sex segregation, 
Um, so, you know, the, the men are the bosses. The women go out and do the sales, and uh, their jobs are dependent on commissions. And I, I'm thinking, I don't know if they still have that in, the, in some of the um, houseware industries and some of the makeup industries, et cetera, uh, where it's commission-based sales. Uh, but they certainly still have commission arrangements. And I'm, yeah. I, there might be some parallels there. I think there would be, and I, um, I think the whole commission thing is interesting too because of the Sears case in um, employment discrimination law where actually the better jobs were the commission sales and those tended to be men and the argument that the employer said um, justified that sex segregation was, oh well women don't want to take the risk of being paid by commission. But nowadays I think maybe it's different um, and that would be a good analogy. Um, and that sort of ties into the whole role of the customer, right, in terms of determining the conditions <coughs> and abilities of employment is, again, really the customer is playing a bigger role than we account for in our traditional legal understanding. So that's a great idea. And also, I don't know to the extent you want to expand the definition of sexual harassment beyond the sex-driven, you know, uh, sex-related and move it into the insults, sort of the, the sometimes called gender harassment kinds of practices. Um, but if so, there's some interesting, uh, you know, there's some interesting information on that as well. So you mean like just um, sort of like hostility towards women, that sort yeah, of thing? Yeah, like Nikki Schultz and her work on yeah. how, uh, um, that really, if you think of sexual harassment as a means for domination uh, uh, and, and, and the flip subordination, then, uh, it, uh, then sex-related actions are really just a subsample or a, a subset of things that can be done for individuals to maintain that dominant position. But things like insult, well, like pr even Price Waterhouse goes way back, but it illustrates the kind of, uh, of uh, practices that can be done. And Price Waterhouse, of course, was not conceived as a sexual harassment case, but I think in today's world, one could imagine it could be a kind of sexual harassment case. Yeah, I think you're right. And um, we haven't designed this, the survey yet, or um, the, done the interviews yet, because we're waiting to get funding. But, um, <laughs> but we could include questions about gender-based insults. We also could include questions about racial insults, um, because in some of these settings with service work in general um, there is literature that shows that customers and patients treat service and health service workers differently based on race and gender because they think it's okay right or they view them as being more servile than a male performing the same job yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and are you familiar with the EEOC report on sexual harassment uh, let's, uh, there was a task force. Yeah, did it come out recently, like in the last year? I think. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, there's a, they 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 uh, they have decided to define what they study as sexual harassment in this broader sense, and and so there might be some interesting thing there to draw from as well. Okay, thanks. Um, I don't know if Pam, you had your hand up way back. Okay. Oh, yes. Yeah. Wasn't in the uh, in the construction worker case, was was there a standard about the level of, of sanitation of the facilities that were being offered? Certainly I can understand from an employer perspective why you might be concerned about people coming on and off a job site uh -huh. while they're while you're compensating them, I suppose. It, it strikes me that that seems like it'd be something that would be Fixable. Right, and, and they, right, exactly. And certainly I can understand that yeah. there would be more pressure on biology and, and comfort mm -hmm. and cleanliness, but it would seem that you would be able to provide adequate facilities. I mean, was there a, was there a per se standard that the employer was accused of not me meeting, or did they try and defend on an OSHA standard, or <coughs> the practice of, you know, white <coughs> flush and, Mr. John and so they I mean they basically had Mr. John um, and they were sort of your usual 
conditions at those. <laughs> I could read from the opinion if you would like, but anyway, um, they they were, you know, just your standard porta potties on a construction site, and um, so I think the employer, first of all, didn't view um, work conditions as something that should be the basis of a disparate impact claim, and the court said work conditions can be, um, and. Uh, they offered no evidence of business necessity. Their position was they weren't discriminating because she had access to the same facilities as the men. So they, they weren't trying to justify what they were doing. They were just saying, she, everybody gets this. We're not treating her worse. So I don't think they were trying to defend their facilities. Yeah. And and, and, and her, yeah, okay, so it was, there was no, it was sort of, sort of sort of a matter of opinion about whether that facility was adequate. I don't think the question was whether the facility was adequate. I think the question was whether it was, it had a disparate impact. Like, so do these really bad um, facilities affect women worse than men? That was the question that the case was focusing on. They weren't trying to say these facilities are in any way adequate. They were just saying, we're not discriminating, right? And um, it doesn't impose a disparate impact. It does not, and the district court agreed with them and determined that the unsanitary and inadequate toilet facilities did not impose a substantial burden on women that men need not suffer. So nobody was disputing these were really bad facilities. So, I mean, if the idea is kind of this unspoken idea is that um, men and women use bathrooms differently, right? And so it might, it might be, in fact, not safe and hygienic for women, whereas it would be for men, and hence the disparate impact. I mean, well, right. So that's yeah. why the court said she has stated a claim. Yeah, yeah. It's because you're putting this burden on the women who work there, and there weren't very many women. It was a construction site in the 80s. Um, and the employer was saying, this is what we provide our construction workers and, you know, deal with it. Well, uh, that's a funny note to end on. Yes. <laughs> nonetheless, <laughs> nonetheless. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> nonetheless, thank you. And I hope uh, uh, you got some good ideas. And I know we, we really uh, appreciate it and enjoyed the talk. So thank, thank you. you.